scientists, we need to be hiring vets, and we need to be making a mission uh, of, of anyone who hasn't served, that you, this is our way of serving. Perhaps we pr provide jobs or employment or help to people who have served and, and make it a collective service as opposed to the situation that William just described of sort of this, you know, a very small set of people serving and providing the rest of us the freedoms that we have and many of us take for granted now. Um, so thank you for pointing all that out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Pete is our last speaker tonight. Pete is also um, tonight. Tonight. Like today. Well, it was it supposed like to be like today. Like We're going to finish strong. <laughs> um, uh, Pete has and Ashley have been wonderful hosts in helping us here at Pepperdine with Gov20 LA. Um, really have a, a strong partnership and very excited about it. And um, so Pete Peterson, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as the last speaker, I guess one of my responsibilities is try to bring somehow all the presentations together in one last one. And you know, I was actually in pretty good shape there until we came to this last presentation and now I really, there's no way that I can, A, should be following it and B, can connect that to my presentation. So even with you, Nebus, perfect together. We understand the Jersey connection there, New Jersey and you perfect together. So there's a little NASA here, there's, what's that? Garden State, of course, as a uh, longtime uh, denizen of the Jersey uh, State. I'm very excited that you're here to talk. Um, so what I'm going to do, and I'm, I'm definitely going to want to keep my um, comments short here, but what I want to talk about today is really what has been touched on across all the presentations so far today, which is essentially at the 30,000-foot level, the relationship between governments and citizens is fundamentally changing. Now, part of that has to do with technology. A lot of that has to do with technology, but there are also some other things that are going on. And so, just to look at um, the agenda for my talk this afternoon, is first to introduce the Davenport Institute, because really what we're gonna, I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon is the work that we've done going off of some experiences and uh, to talk broadly about what I'm seeing to be this changing relationship between citizens and their governing institutions, to look at what I call the ironies of public engagement and technology, uh, to look at some concepts that resonate with the public sector, because as has been talked about several times here, um, there are some real challenges here in communicating these concepts of participatory governance and technology within the public sector. Um, and there are some things and terms and concepts that we've used in our consulting with and training public sector workers in being much more amenable to these concepts. And then finally, to look at what I'm calling Citizenville in the city of Bell. And I hope most of you know that book by our Lieutenant Governor, uh, Citizenville, but also to apply it into a context that most of you probably would never have guessed. So first an introduction, the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement and Civic Leadership is based here at Pepperdine at the School of Public Policy. My office is right upstairs. I actually teach a class in this very classroom entitled Leadership Through Public Engagement to Master's Candidates in Public Policy. And the work that I do is really only 10% inside the classroom and 90% outside because uh, the Davenport Institute is really about consulting with and training public sector leaders in how to better engage their residents in making very difficult local or regional decisions. And we do that in three different ways. One is that we consult on these projects. So we're contracted by municipalities and, and uh, county special districts to either lead town hall meetings. I've done some of that work actually here for the city of Malibu and around the state. 
We also have a Rolodex of practitioners and facilitators that depending on subject matter experience or the scale or scope of the project, we will connect those facilitators up with municipalities to do uh, a more engaged uh, public process. The second thing we do, and we're about a month away from kicking it off, is our annual public engagement grant program. So this will be the sixth annual public engagement grant program. So we've awarded uh, upwards of $300,000 to cities, counties, special districts, and civic organizations all throughout the state of California over the last five years to support a more uh, participatory public process. Some of the, those monies are used to create websites, uh, others that are used to hire facilitators, others that are used to um, conduct a better outreach program. And from that program, the annual public engagement grant program, it has taken me around the state from La Mesa up to Arcata on projects ranging from youth civic engagement to water policy to public safety to budgets and especially in the area of planning. And so it was out of those first few years of experiences with the grant program, working and consulting with municipalities, that we learned one very important lesson, that when we use the phrase public engagement or participatory governance, there's a chance that the other person on the other side of that table, whether they're a city manager, planner, mayor, regional government official, they're hearing something very different, right? And so we actually spent some good grant money after some very bad projects and learned a very uh, acute lesson that maybe we want to actually take a step back and create a training program around this. So the third piece of what I do around the state and increasingly, increasingly now around the country is leading half and full day and webinar training programs around this uh, area of participatory governance. And over the last four years, we've had around five or 600 public sector officials from all over the country, from mayors, city managers, planners, public works directors, go through this training and are now leading much more effective public processes. So the premise of this talk is really in some ways the premise of this conference, which is, is there what I'm calling a quiet revolution in government, in this relationship between municipalities, uh, state governments, not so much the federal government yet, but state governments and their citizens. And I'm gonna break all the rules of PowerPoint by greeting you with a text-saturated slide. But this is from a good friend of mine, Dave Knapp. He used to be city manager in Cupertino and is now, uh, as you see here, out in Highland Park, Illinois. Has been in local government for 30 years. And uh, before going out to Illinois, he was on our advisory council to the Davenport Institute. And this was something he said in, a, in an interview. It used to be that if you did something, you had to tell the public about it. And then it became if you are planning to do something, you have to tell them about it. And then it became if you are planning to do something, you have to offer them an opportunity to come in and say what they want to say. You don't have to do anything about it, but you have to give them the opportunity to come in and have input. The model now is when you have an issue, you are better off to have the community weigh in on the definition of the problem, the possible solutions of the problem, and to actually affect the outcome of the decisions process. Now, I could point out dozens of municipal officials that get this. Now, I, now I wouldn't say this is a one percenter view, uh, but I would say it's probably close to a 15 or 20 percent view. And as you look through, just to hit you with a couple data points, one of the things that I get to do in working with a lot of local government officials is I, we do training and I do speaking at a lot of local government conferences. And I thought it was interesting just in these last couple of years to look at some of the, the titles, trainings, and subject matter areas of discussion in uh, two of the top municipal government conferences. Just look back here, 2012 National League of Cities Conference. One third of their leadership training courses involved public engagement in one way, shape, or form. Uh, the 2012 ICMA, International City County Management Association, that was held in Phoenix, we did a training uh, session there. Engaging Citizens was its own education track, and one-third of the university workshops, the kind of pre-conference workshops, had something to do with participatory governance or public engagement, either looking at online tools, applications, or leading more effective public processes. As a university, and being based at a university, I'm also part of the American Society for Public Administration, 
And the ASPA conference is really the gathering of most of the major uh, public administration and public policy schools in the country. And the title for their 2012 uh, conference, as you see here, Redefining Public Service Through Civic Engagement. And one of the things that's been discussed here is what current municipal officials are doing, and I think it's important as we're based here actually in a school of public policy, is to take a look at what is a quiet revolution in how we're educating our future municipal leaders. Because the people coming out of this school are trained differently than the ones that are currently working in municipal government. And if you look at the curricula that is being discussed, one of the things that is kind of on the bleeding edge right now are courses, not to be self-serving, but courses like I'm teaching. This Leadership Through Public Engagement is a course that I've taught here for several years. When we, it, was, it was first started five years ago, it was one of maybe three or four courses like it being taught in public administration or public policy schools. And now there are dozens of these being taught. I'm actually part of a university network of organizations where there are 30 plus universities with institutes like the Davenport Institute that are addressing these issues of public engagement, either looking at the technology piece or just the sheer education or training piece um, in new ways. And so to look at the future leaders and how we're training them in schools of public policy, it's important to know that even at this stage, uh, the way that we're training our future public officials is fundamentally changing around this area. Now, I would just note one thing. There are currently no schools that are talking about Gov 2.0. I know very few that are even discussing this. Is that right? Oh, Beth Novak. Okay. So, well, and then that would be the first one to have a, a single course dedicated to that. So, in much of the same way, and this will kind of be the context or theme of my remarks, where public engagement is really fundamentally changing. Uh, both in the ways that mus municipal governments deal with their citizens. Um, technology is also making that same change. First in what's happening out there, but then what's happening in schools of public policy and public administration. So just a little call out there, and this goes out to the studio audience here who's watching the live stream. If you have some real expertise in this Gov 2.0 area, and you're in the area of a school of public policy or public administration, whether you have a PhD or not, you should approach them uh, with the idea for teaching a course in that school because this, this subject matter is in desperate need in schools of public policy and public administration. So what I want to do is first look at the good, the bad, the ugly of public engagement, okay? And I'm going to use some data points here to show that what Dave Knapp, that quotation I showed before, really was a 10% solution. We're still looking at turning around a ship inside a teacup. And this goes to some of the comments that you were making about San Diego, um, and I could replicate those all around the state, that when we're talking about some of these issues around public engagement and technology, there is both confusion and fear with a lot of the government officials that we deal with. So on the positive side, this is some data that's come out of a, a 2010 report conducted by the National League of Cities called Ma Making Local Democracy Work. Uh, just as a very brief header, and the, the, the data for this has been embargoed, but I am working on a, a survey study with the uh, California League of Cities, including their Institute for Local Government, as well as the firm Public Agenda and the James Irvine Foundation. Within the next month, we're gonna be releasing a statewide survey of how California public sector officials view both public engagement and technology. So stay tuned for that. Um, there's some very interesting data coming out there about how municipal officials view public engagement, but also how they view uh, data transparency and using technology. So to the uh, statement, indicate how likely your government is to set up some sort of deliberative process to engage the public. The 3,3200 municipal officials from around the country, this was the results. 82% said likely or very likely on a zoning or land use issue, and 76% of those surveyed said likely or very likely on a budget issue. And we continue to see these very high rates of response when you ask municipal officials in particular, but even county and regional officials, do you know that you have to engage the public? Most of them know that they have to. So to take a look at the bad and ugly, uh, and this is all from the same study, at least these first two data points, 
To the statement, public engagement processes typically attract mostly the same people who complain or promote their favorite solutions. 81% strongly agreed or agreed with that statement. To the question, does your city have the skills, training, or experience they need in order to do effective, deliberative public engagement? Almost half said no. Now, this last data point comes from the training that we do all over the country. And at a certain stage in the training, we'll just uh, we'll put up a couple flip charts and we'll just do a little popcorn question. When I say the public, what's the first word that comes into your mind? And we have to make sure that all the people in the room realize that this is not being videotaped. And so in a very open way, uh, these are the kinds of responses that you get. And whether you're talking about a national conference when we do a training or a conference that we're doing here in California, you can, you can predict that three quarters to 80% of those responses when asked, what do you think about the public are going to be negative. So you get words like NIMBY, stupid, narrow, uninformed. What was the percentage that you said was negative? Three quarters to 80% of the responses. Oh, no, 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 three quarters to 80%. And again, we've done this now over four years all over the country, and this you, could, you can really set your watch by it. So you get that there's a tension here, right? You get what I call that there's a trilemma of public engagement and participatory governance. On one side, you have public sector officials that understand that they know they have to engage their residents. On the other part, you know that half of them realize that they don't have the skills or ability to do it. And on the third part, you have, by and large, people that don't really like the public that they usually have to engage. So a question that we always ask in the training work that we do, are public officials masochists? <laughs> now, this is not a light question. If you look at uh, a lot of the town hall meetings that are out there, there's usually some sort of either nobody's in the room or the people that you want in the room, you really don't want to be there. And one of the real important lessons that I've learned in working in this space for several years now is that a lot of these public sector officials that you work with are not cynical about the public. They've learned some very hard lessons from the ways in which they've had to engage the public. Right? So when I started in this work, I was all about, oh, you really need to engage the public. You could learn so many, there are so many great benefits. You could learn creative ideas and you can make more sustainable decisions. And I said, why don't you come to the public meeting we're gonna have about the general plan and you just let me know how much I'm gonna learn from this. And you show up there and it's just one three minute rant after another. So, a lot of these lessons have redounded to me in, in what I'm calling the ironies of public participation and technology. So the first one is, the processes by which our governing institutions engage residents invite confrontation and a lack of thoughtful deliberation. Three minutes at a microphone is a setup for confrontation and a lack of thoughtful deliberation. But when you say, if anyone in here is looking for their local governments or even the federal government to be more engaging in their residents, you need to do a better job of engaging us. Their mind is gonna go right back to the last town hall meeting they did, which was a total meltdown. The second thing is the technology that is proposed to enable collaboration between citizens and government often creates fear within the public sector. Um, I don't know if any of you follow the Twitter feed or the work that um, the chief information officer of the city of Palo Alto, Jonathan Reichenthal, I think he's really one of the bright lights in this field. And I think what's been so great, I was introduced to him by the city manager there, Jim Keene, who's on the advisory council to the Davenport Institute. He comes from a, a long career in the private sector before coming into the public sector. And, uh, but was really in this Gov 2.0 space. And one of the lessons that he's really taught me over the last year or so is, you know, Pete, there are, uh, if, there's, if there are ever two terms that really do grind the minds of many experienced public sector officials, it's public engagement and technology, <laughs> right? So unless you're, you're able to kind of walk through that with people and to acknowledge the real fears that are there, you're not really going to be able to change systems, change attitudes, 
and change perspectives. So one of the things, and this is, we're going to tie this in now to the world of technology and how technology is being used to engage the public. Where I see public engagement and technology and colliding are in a couple different areas. One is what I call the, the language problem. So in public engagement, when uh, we issued those first couple years of grant programs, one of the real lessons that we learned is when I said, sat across the table from the city manager in wherever, Salinas, and said, are you ready to engage your public on this budget issue? They would say, oh, absolutely, Mr. Peterson. We're really looking forward to this grant. We're going to hire a facilitator, and it's going to be great. Now, what we learned too late, and I'm not going to say it was that process, but what we learned too late in several processes is that when many government officials hear public engagement, they hear, I'm going to inform the public, right? Now, the late, great senator, political scientist Daniel Patrick Moynihan has the classic quotation on this. He said once that public engagement is the process by which a public sector official engages a private sector citizen to do what the public sector official wants, right? And so it's this idea that as long as we get the public together, yeah, you know, I might have to take it for three or four hours in little three-minute snippets, but in the end, we kind of know where this is going. We know where this general plan is going. We know where this transportation plan is going. We know where this budget is going. And again, a lot of that is tied to the processes that have always been used. So being very particular about the terms you use to engage the public and the reasons why you're doing it is as simple as that sounds. That is a major premise of the training work that we do is just making sure that public sector officials understand when you call something a town hall, that carries with it some feelings about participation. And if you're not ready for that participation, don't call it a town hall. Don't engage your public, call it an information session. And everything from how you set that room up to how you design the process needs to be connected to what your intentions are. And in much the same way, I see the same thing in views of technology, right? Because you understand, and this has really been throughout the day here today, a lot of the talk and the users of technology are not IT departments, right? These are across departments, people that never learned a single thing about these things in schools of public policy and public administration. They're all learning about it on the fly from people like you and others. But at the same time, when they're reading some of these articles about Gov 2.0 and online public engagement and transparency, that all these terms are being thrown around without clearly defining what you're doing with it. So being very particular about what you're going to use technology to do, again, as simple as that sounds, that if you're engaging with governments, you have to be very clear, especially if you're not talking to the Jonathan Reichenthal's of this world, this is what this does, and this is what this means to you. Because you can often be confronted by people saying, oh, I've heard about all that transparency stuff. I don't want to get into it. Or you'll get somebody else saying, oh, I need that Gov 2.0 stuff. I just came from the ICMA conference, and they told me that I really need whatever that Gov 2.0. Just give me that system, whatever. I'll just plug it into the wall here, and we're going to be Gov 2.0 ready and certified. So the other related piece, and this, again, is where technology connects with public engagement, is a lack of preparation for what you're going to do with the results. How many projects have we been a part of that we get called in to consult after there's been some sort of town hall meeting that everybody showed up, felt really good about it, and then they realize, you know what? Nobody's writing anything down. <laughs> Nobody's doing anything. How many times have we seen in platforms, social media platforms, or even some of these online public engagement platforms that people participate? There was a classic story. This was just a couple years ago. Mayor Villaraigosa conducted um, a an online budget town hall using Next Ten's budget challenge tool. Do you, does anybody remember this story? Okay. Use the LA Times. I want Angelinas to participate. We really need to close a big budget gap. We want everybody in. Here's the link to the site. We want you all to participate. A couple of hackers found out within a day that you actually, now this, if you're not familiar with the Next Ten budget tool, essentially it's like what I would call a survey monkey on steroids. You answer a series of questions, either raising revenues or cutting services, and you have a little bar on the side which shows what impact you're having on the budget deficit, right? Well, it turns out, not that this was ever said on the site itself, that you could not balance the budget unless you privatized city parking, which happened to be one of the mayor's pet issues. 
Now, this is not an argument for or against it, privatizing parking. This is an argument for making sure you know what you're doing and being transparent when you go before the public saying we want to hear from you, and then you realize that that tool, there's a little person behind the curtain there, and it looks a lot like Mayor Villaraigosa in this case. So being very upfront about what you're going to do with the results, whether you're online or engaging in a face-to-face -face discussion, um, is extremely important. So I want to make this further transition in connecting public engagement and participatory governments into uh, the Gov 2.0 space. And this was a quotation from a recent white paper on uh, open data and transparency, uh, John Walton. Uh, then uh, CIO for the city and county of San Francisco. Back when we started focusing on e-government in the late 80s and early 90s, it was about automation, taking manual systems or maybe old mainframe systems uh, and trying to come up with a website. That was e-government. Open data for me is not just about automating processes, but is an example of how you engage with a citizen. E before was electronic, E now is about engagement. And so, the same rules and thinking applies if you're going to be engaging your residents online as it does for these growing number of facilitated public processes. So let's look at a couple concepts that we found really do resonate again with uh, public sector officials that really do get their backup, and understandably so, given past experiences with using both technology and being uh, leading more participatory processes. One is the co this, uh, concept of the spectrum. One of the things we talk about in the training that we do is that it's perfectly okay to simply engage the public in order to inform them. Totally fine. If there's some sort of uh, public safety issue or if there's something having to do with some building project that's uh, going to impact a certain neighborhood, then folks, you uh, in the planning department or public works or public safety, you need to be out in front of your residents letting them know that this is coming. Where we've seen a lot of disconnect, again, as I said before, is where a project is uh, portrayed as being participatory, but it's really an informing process. And that's really where you see a lot of projects melting down. So just being upfront, but also allowing that there is a role for the PIO, right? There's a role for the public information officer in your municipality to get information out to the public. Second is your purpose determines your process. This is a pet phrase that we came up with in uh, our training programs. But once that purpose is set in the spectrum, whether you're going to inform or you really want to hear some feedback, or, and this is what we're seeing increasingly, do you want to engage your residents in actually turning service delivery over to them, right? That your purpose for engaging them needs to connect with that. Now, you could say the same thing about technology, that depending on your reason and the feedback that you're looking for, the kind of platform that you use will vary. Another concept we found um, resonates is what I call the X-Files of leadership. Some of you remember the television show X-Files. Uh, the tagline for that show is the truth is out there. And I use that phrase in the training work we do with municipal government officials to say sometimes, you know, the truth is not in city hall all the time. The truth is not in the state government or the county administrative office all the time. Some of the most smart, some of the smartest people that you have in public safety, and this actually, I am going to bring in Team Rubicon right here, right here. I didn't think I was going to do it, but I'm doing it right here. If you're with the Red Cross or some of these other aid organizations, the smartest people that you have in, uh, the smartest people that you can find in going into a natural disaster or man-made disaster situation are probably not going to be the people that work for you. Right? It's going to be people that actually have experience in doing those things. And for municipalities, some of the smartest economic and budget minds you have do not work for your city. Some of the best planners and architects in your city do not work inside City Hall. Some of, the some of your experts in public safety actually don't work for your police department. Right? And so leading a public sector, uh, a public engagement process that enables you to unearth some of those ideas and participation is amazing. We did, a, we did a public engagement project around water for the Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District up in Northern California. E extremely complex uh, issue that was going on there. Uh, there was some science involved and you know, it was very complex, but they, the, 
Water District led a 13-month public process to engage residents of that region in making a decision. The issue was they actually had too much water up there and they didn't know what to do with it. This was after two pulp mills closed. It just was a, an amazing, I'm happy to talk about that story further offline. But one of the meetings that I went to, the, the public engagement workshops that I went to, it turns out that two area environmental scientists happened to live in that area, got the flyer that they were having a workshop, showed up, and, cr and provided some ideas to the water district about what they could do with that water in the area of using algae to produce energy, that they had, the water district had never thought about these things. Okay? And time and time again, when we're consulting on these projects, you find that a lot of the experts with either local knowledge or project knowledge or product knowledge are really living in your community, but we're not inviting them into a process by which they can really make their feelings or experience known. Second is customers or citizens. Um, I don't know if we mentioned TED Talks before. I don't know if anyone's uh, seen the TED Talk uh, by the woman who heads up uh, Code for America. Um, it's really a very interesting discussion about what are citizens. Are we, are we customers and receivers of, of services, or do we actually, can we actually play a more active role in our communities? Now, she's looking at that from a platform perspective, either online or applications, and that is absolutely true. But folks, I have to tell you, what's been going on around the state of California with San Bernardino, Vallejo, Stockton, that's not it, folks. We're gonna have more bankrupt cities this year the relationship and the importance of citizens engaging at a deeper level in their communities is going to be increasingly important. And then finally, mean what you say. So that, again, relates back on the public engagement side and your purpose determines your process, but it certainly also connects to when you're dealing with technology. So as we split these apart, these are, again, some ways of classifying technology in the public engagement space that we found really do connect with public sector officials that are not really, um, that are still learning about these things or just brushing up against it in Governing Magazine and the National League of Cities Conference and all the other places where they get information. One is to split apart transparency, Gov 2.0, and what I'm calling online engagement, right? So online public engagement platforms are not, it's not open data, right? We understand that. It is not transparency. It is not it may fall under the umbrella of Gov 2.0, but it's not necessarily an application. So in one sense, we have what I would call the ideator platforms, things like MindMixer, UserVoice, MixedInk, and there are several others, in which a municipality is looking to unearth ideas from the community and using an online platform to do that. The second variety is what I call the Survey Monkey on steroids, and I mentioned it bef uh, before, the Next 10 platform, the Budget Challenge, and they have some others related to environmental policy, and there are a lot of custom platforms that municipalities are coming up with that are asking active questions, and those answers that come back actually affect some other, either a budget scenario or some other uh, graphic. Finally is what I would call the GPS or map-based, and I heard before from, from Karen doing some of the work in this area, but this is especially in the field of uh, planning, general plans, downtown elements, uh, increasingly now, um, climate action plans, and using GPS-based uh, satellite images to engage residents in uh, public works projects or planning. We're seeing more and more municipalities using that. Government 2.0 is I would separate rather than use it as an umbrella term. And so when I'm working with public sector officials, I'm breaking these uh, different parts uh, in defining Gov 2.0. One is obviously public safety. You may have heard of the San Ramon Valley uh, Fire uh, District app where people signed on to, uh, to show that they had CPR training and if somebody has a heart attack, they ping the people that have CPR training in the, in the area. Um, there are a lot of these and especially this audience is very familiar with them. Public work, C Click Fix is the most prominent but there are a lot of others. Public service, the Boston Fire Hydrant one that came from Code for America and the Tsunami Sirens, there are others. Public transportation, uh, handheld applications for that using uh, data that's been downloaded, you know, many of those, and obviously social media platforms and blogs, I would put under um, the more directly Gov 2.0 rubric. This is where I think a lot of where 
um, this digital area is going in changing the relationship between citizens and governments. This is the uh, open budget platform for the city of Palo Alto. It was launched a couple of months ago, and it's using a um, it's using a platform put out by a firm in Palo in Mountain View called Delphi Solutions, and a lot of uh, where I'm seeing municipalities going, if you go into even the city hall here in Malibu and say, I want to see the, um, um, the municipal budget document, you're going to get a three ring binder <laughs> and it's going to have hundreds of Excel spreadsheets printed out and somehow you're supposed to make heads or tails of this. Uh, this is where all budgets are going. I come from a printing and marketing communications background and I worked at a web development firm in New York uh, right in the transition between 99 and 2000. And one of the, their top products was taking annual reports and converting them into PDFs <laughs> and making them slightly different, the functionality of a digital document versus a, a printed one. Um, I see the same transition happening here, but in a much more deep way. That not only are you going to be able to play around, and I really do invite you to, if you haven't uh, played around with this, um, just Google Open Budget Platform for Palo Alto. Uh, not only do you get to learn a lot about uh, how your municipality spends the money, but if you go over to the Explore button there on the right, it's a civic education tool, right? And so municipalities that are getting this are taking this into the classroom and educating their high school students about this is really what happens in your local government, right? And so your ability not just to download the budget, the, the budget information, which you can do from this, but also to play around with it uh, looking at different scenarios is really where uh, a lot of municipalities are going to be going to in the future. Now, why are they going in this direction? Uh, what's the worst that could happen with not engaging your residents? Uh, you may know this is a photograph of Robert Rizzo, the uh, indicted city manager for the city of Bell. I'm not going to get into that story other than to say his uh, trial is actually upon us. So if you want to follow the story that was uncovered back in 2010 on the front page of the LA Times, um, it makes for some incredible reading. Just to, just to point out, this is ICE Hawk Custody of Palo Alto Sheriff. Yeah. Well, the, un the untold story, and I'm going to tell it now, is that after Bell fell apart, after the city council was completely stripped, after all the top administrative officials were fired and or indicted, uh, a friend of mine and an advisor to the Davenport Institute, the longtime city manager for San Luis Obispo, called me up to say, Pete, I just, got, I just took the job to be the interim city manager in the city of Bell. And I did it under two conditions. One is that I can, I'll only do it for free. And secondly, I'll only do it for two months. And he says, this is what I want to do. I want, you, I want your help in consulting with a completely new participatory budgeting project for the city of Bell. And so last year, January of last year, after a couple months of engaging with the new city staff there and the new council, uh, we led a series of public budgeting processes in the city of Bell. It was a completely uh, different way <laughs> of looking at the budget. And for a city that in the LA Times was nicknamed the Kremlin, that's what City Hall was nicknamed, the Kremlin, this was a completely different way of opening the doors to the city budget. So there's a picture of me there facilitating my table. Um, that's Ken Hampion there, by the way. And this process was, I'm not going to say it was the deepest public process in the world, but relative to what had been there, uh, the fact that citizens had an, even an understanding of where their budget monies went from and it went, came from and went to, and then had a chance to feed back in a document that came out of this process that actually did inform last year's budget um, was really amazing. So I want to play a brief video and we're not going to be able to play it over the speaker, so I'll turn this up. But this was just a minute video of that, one of those workshop. Yeah. 
input in, uh, in this kind of discussion where they have an input with the budget. This is what we want, a uh, good, ethical, transparent government. The city now is giving us the opportunity to be involved in the process. Uh, the contributions that the city makes to the retirement, the disability, and those are huge. My vision is that we would leave with the new council to a more transparent city process and um, local government we, we could trust going forward. And if you have trust, people can work together even when they have different ideas and big problems can be solved. Having a transparent government, ethical government. City of Bell, is really and Bell just got an it, A minus rating state, from the Sunlight the Foundation Bell. because of uh, its level of transparency in providing not only access to council meetings, live streaming council meetings, but documents and uh, participation around the budget. Um, there had been talk when Bell fell apart that, well, you know it's Bell, right? There are people there that just, they're not really going to understand. They've disengaged from the process and, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do. Y you know, you can expect something like that to happen. I remember Steve Lopez art, uh, uh, op-ed piece in the LA Times, which is just, to me, breathtaking in how, uh, how it described what was happening there. This, this is not the way this has to be, right? And if it can work in Bell around public engagement, transparency, it can work anywhere. Bell is doing better than most cities today in how it's presenting information about its municipality, what's happening inside of City Hall, and engaging its residents in making decisions. And I'll just go here to my last slide. The benefits of what they're doing, and this was really Ken Hampion's idea when he landed, he's what I call a civic first responder when he, when he came on the scene there at Bell, is he used a public process not just to get more information from citizens, but to actually change the identity of a city. Right? Now, it could be argued, and I understand in some ways that Bell is an anomaly, that in a lot of our governments today, we have a two-way relationship where we have citizens that are disengaging and governments that are perfectly happy with keeping information close. Now, I would argue, and it's really been the argument of this day today, that that is an unsustainable model. And two bad things happen. One is that you have, you find governments that then are allowed to make some brutally difficult, corrupt decisions. Right? And you have citizens that are not accessed in participating in their lives of their communities. Now, if you looked at that public engagement workshop in Bell, it looked like the UN. We had Spanish-speaking tables, English-speaking tables, simultaneous translations going, you cannot tell me that we can't be doing a better job of engaging our residents in making these kinds of decisions. And as it relates to technology, you speak with Reichenthal at Palo Alto, he says, now I know I know there may not be two more different cities than Bell and Palo Alto, but he says we're being dragged into this work by our residents. And increasingly, as generations change, as natives come into positions of leadership and citizenship, they're going to demand things like the new Bell website. They're going to demand things like the open budget platform. And they're going to demand more opportunities to participate in the lives of their communities. So I want to thank you all for making it this far and uh, for doing the work that you do. Well, I, here are the forces working against that. And I, I, you know, the book, The Tipping Point, I, I, I'm not sure if there's going to be a tipping point. But if you go to local government, municipal government conferences now, you, you could almost be excused for thinking this is a fad. This is how much public engagement and, and technology and open data and transparency are being discussed in those places. One, generations are changing. 
and people that are coming into positions of leadership in governments, this is their perspective. And so the people that are retiring, that in many ways were really looking towards that 2025 year and they don't want to do something called transparency. I'm so close to finishing up here. Um, and again, for some understandable reasons, but we're going to have new positions of leadership. Secondly, it could be argued, in fact, I'll make this argument, that if there was uh, a greater level of public engagement in San Bernardino around the budget a year and a half ago, that city would not be declaring bankruptcy. Because essentially, if you followed that story, what happened there is most of the residents of that city didn't, and this is a city of about 230,000 people, right? This is not some tiny town somewhere. Um, most of the residents of that town didn't know the city was going bankrupt until the night of the council meeting when they declared bankruptcy. So the question then becomes, what if we had taken, and, and you know, you've pro if you've continued to follow that story, they've slashed their police force by a third. You know, there's no public engagement now, folks. It is DEFCON 1, right? We are making, we're, we're making decisions now on the fly just to stay afloat. It really is. And so you wonder if they had, if you were able to rewind the tape two years ago to say, folks, this is where we're headed. And if we're not going to make some decisions here, they're going to be made for us. I would argue that um, that more participatory approach would have saved that city from going bankrupt. And so the other force is what I call um, fiscal decisions of a scale and scope that most municipalities never thought they were going to have to face. And with all the talk about, well, the, the economy's coming back and everything's going to be fine, you go into a lot of city halls like I do, the whole discussion around pension and benefit obligations, we're looking at hundreds of millions and billions of dollars of unfunded liabilities that we're not really dealing with. And uh, part of the bankruptcy stories, not the whole story, but part of the bankruptcy stories around California are related to people really pushing decisions off um, before you're in a situation where, like a Vallejo or San Bernardino, Gonna have to cut a third of the police force, but I'm sure things are gonna stay as safe as they've always been, you know. Um, so I think that the that fiscal impetus is really gonna drive more municipalities to do this. Well, um, there aren't there aren't a lot, I mean, San Jose, what, what you're starting to see cities do is not having the municipal government make these decisions, but try to put it before the public in some sort of ballot measure. Um, that was a strategy that Chuck Reed used in San Jose and was somewhat to a degree in San Diego as well. Um, and I think that's going to be the way that we begin to see this. There's still some significant legal questions about what you can do um, fiscally around these pension and benefit obligations. Um, you know, the, I, this certainly isn't an easy route, but kind of a stage one route that a lot of cities are approaching is going to two-tier pension systems, mm -hmm. right? Where you say, well, we're gonna leave all the folks that we've hired under a certain situation and scenario as they are, but the new hires we're gonna put inside some sort of different pension and benefit. There are arguments now, and I think San Bernardino makes this case, that two-tier pension was not gonna save that city. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, California, Cal California has not is not there, right? Um, but it's going to have to make some very tough decisions, and I would argue. Even better than the ballot box, there are other processes that municipalities could be engaging their residents in because you just think about it from a, from a subject matter process. Most Californians didn't even think too much about pensions and benefits four or five years ago. We didn't really even have a thought about that. Now you have uh, people really at least beginning to be aware of what's, what's happening. And the, the, the question is then going to be, how are we going to engage that public in making some of these very tough decisions? And this will be more uncomfortable if we don't have some teachers to prioritize people. Yeah. Um, or what police do you need to do in the county? And I know you work hard, but there's going to be some standby. How about Mindy? Right. All of a sudden, our Mindy is now going to have no public officials. 
Right. Well, and, and that's why that's why oftentimes when I'm sitting across the table from a municipal official, uh, every once in a while they'll confide to me and say, Pete, I just need to get some cover on this decision from the public. Now, as I always say in our training, that can be the beginning of a great public process or it can be the beginning of a complete disaster. It's the beginning of a disaster if you're wanting to get cover for a decision that you've already made, but you're going to kind of paint something as a public process. It can be a really good thing if that really is what's forcing you to provide the public with what are some very hard trade-off decisions and say, you know, one of the things about, I, I didn't hit this last bullet point, when we did the, uh, one of the workshops in Bell, the budget workshops, I was, uh, Marco was at my table, lived in Bell for many years, and at the end of the half-day session in going through the budget, he said, man, we did some hard work today. And that's one of the things that I always see in front, of, at the end of the best public processes, is that the public understands, you know, a lot of folks that work in government, they're not just making decisions off the hip, they're making very hard decisions with some significant trade-offs. And oftentimes, our usual public processes like public comment, that invites those kind of people showing up with these silver bullet solutions that really don't get to the real heart of the matter. And it's only through some of these more facilitated discussions and online platforms where you really help people wrestle through, well, if you take this down, this is gonna affect this service. If you raise this tax level, this is going to affect something else over here. The people begin to understand, you know, maybe it's not just about raising taxes or cutting services. Maybe there's some, some other complexities here um, that I didn't think through. Yeah. Right. So, you know, the, the maybe a high level of engagement is not desired. Right. So there's a balance. But I would say in most municipalities and certainly in our state government, the pendulum has swung towards uh, very tightly controlled hierarchical decision making. And when you look at a city like Bell, people are very busy there too, right? But the way in which Ken Hampion and the following interim city manager, Arnie Croce, and now the new full-time city manager who's there, their calculations, their math is to say, I need to build trust through a public process, not use a public process to put another burden on other people. You know, I think it was Oscar Wilde who said the problem with socialism are all the night meetings, right? <laughs> and it, it could be argued that, that uh, some of these public processes, I mean, we're just throwing another thing on top of people. Well, sometimes, you know, we might be looking at a small percentage of major decisions that can be made in this way. I think you, as a public official, you really need to do some diagnostics about what do I go before the public with and what do... What are decisions that we can make here internally? I'm not talking about making things a direct democracy, but what I am saying is we're seeing the uh, penalties in many municipalities of not being more participatory in their decision making. Um, and, and, and those penalties are being paid heavily in, in municipalities that are wrestling with decisions that, that would have been easier to make five or 10 years ago in a more public process. Um, and now, now there's just no room for public engagement. And the only public engagement is protesting at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Or, like or Bell. Or what happened in Bell, right? There, there had to be that initial visceral protesting, organizing piece that came after Bell. But after that was allowed to settle down a little bit, then you could do something like this. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. Thank you all. We'll wrap. Thanks.